Hi, folks. Welcome. It's about 12.02, and we've got about 30 folks with us already. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, folks that are joining us can just kind of uh, jump right in. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope everybody is safe and warm with all of these power outages. Um, we may have a smaller group than planned because of that. Um, I know I just got power back on after about five days. So um, if we're, any of us experience technical difficulties, any of the presenters, please bear with us. We'll sort it out. <laughs> um, I'm Kelly Crane. I am the executive director of the Oregon Farmers Markets Association. I know most of you already. So I'm happy to see all your familiar faces. Um, thanks for joining us to learn more about what happened to uh, our farmers markets in 2020. Our working title was what the heck happened in 2020. Um, so we made it a little more official than that, but um, that's what we're trying to sort out here. So 2020 was quite a year um, due to COVID and wildfires, our markets really had to pivot and then pivot again so much that I think we're all heartily sick of the word pivot. <laughs> um, so we had these ever-changing regulations. Um, we had online marketplaces. Market managers had to learn to enforce face mask wearing. Um, we know that you guys did a lot of hard work. Um, this year and we just really wanted to help you understand how and where it paid off and also some context for like how what you experienced at your market um, looked compared to what the whole state was experiencing. Um, so as you'll remember, we first launched the Oregon Farmers Market Census Survey in 2019. And we plan to really only do it once every two years, but then COVID happened. <laughs> and we decided that you guys deserve to have kind of a snapshot of what changed between 2019 and 2020 in order to think about how COVID and the wildfire Farmers Market Committee. Um, I mentioned also this like growing awareness of the need for greater equity at our farmers markets. Um, so we decided to do another survey in 2020, which was a kind of a refresh on the market basic statistics and also some um, crisis specific questions as well. So we put that data together with some national and some project level data to get a picture of kind of what happened statewide, what happened at the market level, and then what also happened at the vendor level. So before we get started with housekeeping, Let's do a quick check-in that will give us a little practice using some of these uh, Zoom tools. So if you could, in the chat box, you'll see to your right, um, name of the market you're representing or organization, if you could just put that in the chat box. Um, and also, Melissa is going to um, put a quick little poll up. It'll pop up um, asking you what veggie you're most excited to see at your farmer's market this spring. So you just click the one you're most excited about. Um, uh, so we just want to have a good idea of who's with us today. And I'll give a few minutes for us to do that. Seeing a lot of familiar farmers markets in here and also some um, folks from outside of the state of Oregon. Thank you for joining us. We hope that our data and lessons learned are interesting and applicable to your own states. Okay, next slide. Oh, here's the results of our poll. Looks like sugar snap peas are the most exciting spring vegetable for everybody. Um, followed closely by garlic scapes, which are my fave. Um, okay, well, let's do a little housekeeping. So um, this workshop is being recorded and it will be shared on Ofma's website. So if you get disconnected or have to leave or for folks that were not able to be here um, in person due to technical challenges, this will be available later or we'll send it out. Um, so you can feel free to turn your video off if you don't want to be on camera. We want to show respect for the introverts. So whatever makes you most comfortable. But we do love to see your smiling faces if you'd like to leave it on. Um, so to help keep background noise to a minimum, please make sure that you're muting your microphone when you're not speaking. We will give folks chance to, to speak. 
um, we'll have several discussion sections. So if you're not presenting or if you haven't been called on to speak, please keep your microphone muted. Um, if you have a question before it's your kind of turn to talk the discussion sections and you don't want to forget it, you can um, put it in the chat box and Alice Morrison, one of our uh, OFMA board members has volunteered to be our chat box manager. She'll call on you later to answer your question. So thanks, Alice. Um, if you're having technical issues during this workshop, you can send a question through the chat box to Rachel Ward, where it says everyone on your chat box, you can select that um, drop down menu and select just Rachel Ward and she can help you with your technical issues. So thank you, Rachel, for that volunteer. She's also one of our lovely board members. Um, so the chat is at the bottom of your screen. When you chat, make sure to click and choose the right audience. So it'll almost always be everyone, but if you wanna send something just to somebody in particular, um, you can. Keep in mind, we can see these chats <laughs> at the end. So um, they're not a secret. So uh, we already had you put in your farmer's market you're representing. So um, uh, thank you for doing that. Um, next slide. So we also want to take a moment to thank our 2021 sponsors. As you know, OFMA is a nonprofit and we cannot possibly charge our members enough to run OFMA. So um, all of our grants and sponsorships are really important to us. So thank you to Oregon Food Bank, What's Good, Market Works, Local Food, Farm Spread, Manage My Market, Beaverton Farmers Market, and Friends of Family Farmers. And also a lot of this data was collected um, with support from the USDA's um, AMS service through an FMPP grant. So we want to mention that as well. Um, thanks, sponsors. Next slide. Um, so these are our presenters today on this call. There's me um, with that carrot picture um, from when I was actually farming. Uh, there's Ari Asner, he's a board member and also works at Holly Farmers Market. We are lucky enough that Ari is our OFMA treasurer and he's also a CPA and accountant. So we sucker him into helping his <laughs> contribute his skills to projects like this. Thank you, Ari. He will present some of this data. Um, we have Mallory Ray, who's an assistant extension professor at the University of Missouri. She used to be with OSU, and she's been with us for one of our projects for several years, and she's going to present on some vendor level data. And also, uh, last but not least, Amanda Cross, OFMA programs manager. Many of you guys know Amanda. She's wonderful, and she is the one who really helps pull the majority of this data and presentation together, and you'll hear from her later, too. Um, Great, next slide. So just to kind of help give you a framework, we're about to present a lot of data and information to you and we know it can be a little overwhelming. So we wanna help you think about it in these kind of like three different tiers. So first we're gonna talk about these, what we're calling market macros. Um, that will be our statewide market level data about like gross sales, vendors, visitorship as this like large group and then as kind of subgroups. We'll also dig in on these topics, um, wildfires, online markets, COVID-19, and DEI, and how your markets are responding to these, what you experience with regard to these. Um, and then we'll look at vendor level impacts by um, looking at a case study that we're uh, working on that is, uh, involves data collection at the vendor level with uh, OFMA's beginning vendor support network. And we'll talk about all of these as we go to, but just so you know, we're kind of gonna start with the big picture stuff, dig in on some topics and then go down to the vendor level um, experiences. So next slide. So just a word about the methodology, just so you know where these like numbers came from. Um, like we mentioned, this 2020 census data is a refresh on our 2019 survey A data. Um, surveys were delivered to the market managers and responses were collected in November 2020. Um, so at the real kind of tail end of everybody's season. Um, so the census results, 67% of the farmers markets in the state completed the census. That's a really good sample size. Um, it represented all size categories, regions, types of communities. Um, so we feel that we have a really good cross section of data to work with. 
Um, we had a lot of the same returning markets from 2019. So we kind of have 2019 and 2020 data to compare. And our response rate in 2019 was even higher because we had more time to, um, to work on that survey um, completion. So um, the vendor level data was collected from this beginning vendor support network. It's five markets. Um, they're mostly smaller mo and or rural markets. So they're not totally representative of the state. We'll talk a little more about that, but it does represent over 200 farms and businesses. And we collected data at every single um, uh, market occurrence from every single vendor or at least 90% or greater. <laughs> so um, it's, it's really good data. Um, and so we'll talk about what we learned from that and then have a discussion on whether that reflects the experience of your vendors or not. So um, we want to thank you guys so much for this impressive rate of participation with this, um, these censuses. We know it takes a long time to fill these out and it's kind of a hassle. And so we feel really committed to making sure that we come back to you with these sorts of um, uh, reports to uh, make sure that this data ends up being useful to you, we hope. <laughs> So yeah, thank you again. Please give yourselves like a big pat on the back for completing this. Um, next slide. And so our big takeaways from looking at the, this 2020 census like snapshot are that compared to 2019, um, vendor participation at markets decreased by almost a third. So that's your total vendors over the course of a year. So not like your peak season vendors, that's like every single vendor who sells even once at your farmer's market across the year. Um, almost a third of those dropped out. We'll talk a little bit more about who persisted and who didn't. Um, gross sales were down by nearly half. So um, in 2000. 19, we had about 63 million in sales for the whole state. So that's all the money at all the farmers markets <laughs> in the whole state. Um, and it went down to about 33 million. Um, so nearly half. Um, big number kind of shocked to see. Um, farmers markets experienced about half as many adult customer visits. And we know some of that was deliberate. You guys discouraging people from bringing their whole families to the market. But as a whole, when we look at all the customers that are estimated to have visited farmers markets in Oregon in 2019, only half as many visited farmers markets in 2020. Um, again, we know there are reasons for that, but um, it is a thing to acknowledge and think about. Um, so in general, larger, more urban markets and also those in tourist destinations experienced more of these impacts, these deficits. Um, and in general, smaller and more rural markets were likely to buck these trends and even see growth. So we have what happened as a whole and we know what happened on average, but we know that there's a large range of individual market and vendor experiences. So, all right, I'm now gonna, Next slide, and I'm going to turn this over to Ari to dig in about kind of these big picture economic pieces. Yeah, <clears throat> so yeah, hi, I'm Ari, and I'll um, walk us through some of those market macro topics that Kelly just uh, outlined. Um, so first off, we want to kind of define what the universe is that we're talking about. So here in these slides, we're going to be talking about all the farmers markets that were operating in Oregon in 2020. Um, so by our count, there were 116 market organizations in existence in 2020, which was actually an increase. The previous year, we'd only counted 106 organizations. However, primarily due to the pandemic, um, only 101 of those organizations actually were operating uh, farmers markets during the calendar year. So 15 of those organizations uh, were still in existence, but did not operate in 2020. Um, and so because of those closures, obviously there was a decrease in the market organizations from 106 to 101, and also an overall decrease of farmer's market locations uh, from 127 in 2019 to uh, 123 in 2020. Next slide. So how many vendors were selling at farmer's markets? Um, so from our data, there were 4,700 vendor businesses participating at farmers markets in Oregon in 2020. So one note on that number, uh, what that number is, is the sum of all of the total vendors from each farmers market. So we expect that there is some 
double counting of vendors that may sell at more than one farmer's market included in that number. It's kind of the best that we can do as far as a broad total. And when taken in that same way year to year allows us to compare what the change was um, from year to year. So that number 4,700 represents a 30% decrease compared to 6,700 businesses in 2019 that were selling at farmer's markets. So 30% fewer vendors at, at urban farmer's markets. And that decrease was shared pretty broadly across farmer's markets uh, in the state, 73 of farmers, 73% of the markets that uh, answered the census reported that their vendor counts decreased in 2020, while well, only 21% said that they saw an increase in vendor counts. 6% um, said their vendor numbers were the same. Next slide. Customers, crowd counts. So Kelly already uh, gave the big top line number here, which is that uh, almost a 50% decrease in visits to farmers markets in 2020. So it was 40%, 48% decrease in crowd counts, total crowd counts across the state from 2019 to 2020. So going from 4.2 million in 2019 to 2.2 million in 2020. We looked at this um, crowd count change uh, by market size because we were able to uh, break it down that way and found that um, seemed that the, the decrease was not experienced, at least on average, as much by small markets. And in fact, our numbers actually show a slight increase in crowd count um, among small markets, but then a decrease, a substantial decrease with large, medium, extra large uh, markets. And these are categorized by how big they are at peak season, how many vendors at the markets at peak season. Next slide. All right, gross sales, dollars. Uh, so as Kelly said, uh, almost a 50% decrease in total gross sales across Oregon farmers markets going from 63 million total sales in 2019 to 33 million in 2020. Um, we were again able to break that down both by market size and also I think really interestingly by region. Um, so by market size, it's a similar trend that we saw with the crowd counts. So big decrease in sales among the largest farmers markets, extra large you know, markets that have 100 plus vendors, large markets, medium markets also have big decreases in gross sales, while small, mark small markets were flat or possibly even uh, a little up in terms of gross sales. Regionally, there's also big variation um, in gross sales. Uh, we saw the biggest impacts in the Portland area, Willamette Valley, and Southern Oregon. Uh, saw the smaller impact in the Oregon coast and the Mount Hood Gorge area. Um, on average, flat sales, no increase or decrease in Eastern Oregon. And then um, based on the result, the response is actually an increase in gross sales for Central Oregon markets. So big difference, uh, it looks like, from one side of the Cascades to the other in terms of uh, how markets total vendor sales did in 2020. Next slide. Yeah, and then we were also able to use the census to get an estimate for total SNAP sales um, for all farmers markets in Oregon. Um, this is something that I don't think, at least in several, at least in this past several years has not been totaled in any kind of real comprehensive way. And this number was created both from census data uh, you know, the off the census data, as well as some information from Farmers Market Fund based on the markets that participate in their Double Up Food Bucks program, uh, giving a total of over $850,000 in SNAP sales in 2020. Um, again, since we haven't done this in, this hasn't been done to our, I think, uh, knowledge uh, in many years, we don't have a 2019 number to compare this to, but we're pretty confident that this represents an increase in SNAP sales from 2019, given the overall increase in SNAP usership and the increase in number of farmers markets that are accepting SNAP. Um, as you can see on the right side here, the number of farmers markets accepting SNAP increased from 92 to 98, also increases in the vendor in the farmers markets accepting FDNP, the Farm Direct Nutrition Program, as well as Double Up Food Bucks, and a big decrease in the overall number of farmers markets that do not offer food assistance programs. Um, in the previous year, that was 32 markets, and that fell by half to only, only 18 markets that aren't doing um, offering some type of food assistance programs. And 
Next slide, I believe this takes us to the end of the market macros section. And I just see that there were a couple questions coming up in the chat as well as a discussion question that we have for you. Yeah, so there are a few questions coming through in the chat right now um, about like kind of what this data represents, Ari. Um, so Rebecca Landis asks, are the stats um, affected by downward size migration of the markets? Um, perhaps did we see like an increase in the number of small markets as they migrate from medium to small category because of that drop in vendors? You do see that in some of the categories, not as much actually in the small category. I think the total number of markets in that category stay the same, but definitely markets falling from extra large into large and large into medium um, had an impact on those numbers. Very interesting. Um, Kathy Zeman also asks about the um, kind of the distribution of the size of markets across the state. Are there more small markets in central Oregon, um, those regions that experienced growth, um, or does that dispersion uh, not seem to affect that growth trend? This is Kelly. I can, um, I can answer that. Kathy, hi. Um, these, there are small markets in Central Oregon. Um, it is a more like generally rural um, area, but they do have some bigger markets too that responded to the survey. Um, so we think it may actually be more of a um, uh, like a cultural uh, phenomenon. Um, we know that there is um, there are very hyper rural areas in Oregon and very densely urban areas in Oregon, and we saw different levels of like. COVID concern and compliance in these different areas that were really strongly attached to like kind of cultural and political identity. So we are making some assumptions that it's actually more closely connected to con COVID concerns, um, levels of COVID concerns than um, like just the sizes. Um, but we're gonna dig in some more on some of the uh, survey questions that we asked and we're, didn't really have the time to fully analyze. And we'll be putting out a report that may shed some additional light that will be more detailed than we have time to go into in this presentation. Um, I hope that helps. Um. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Rachel Ward asks, are the sales and yeah. attendance numbers already accounting for there being less markets open in general this year? I think another way to phrase that would be for the markets we have year over year data uh, for what was the, did we see any trends in like for each particular market dropping in uh, sales or attendance the same way as the general trend. Yeah, so we were not able, to, the way that we have the census data, we were not comparing individual markets from their 2019 responses directly to 2020 responses. So these numbers are looking at the aggregate. Um, however, in the third section of this, we'll be taking kind of an in-depth look at four farmers markets that are participating in the, in the, in the um, beginning market and vendor program. And that'll give us, I think, a bit more kind of um, market level sort of uh, information on that. Yeah, um, I guess maybe another way to phrase Rachel's question that we can think about further is, do we know if these sales um, and attendance numbers are um, comparable to last year per market occurrences in the state instead of just market season mm -hmm. overall? Well, um, you would definitely, it would definitely still be a, be a de decrease, you know, let me think, you know, we don't have anything suggesting that market occurrences fell by say like 50%, you know, we know there was, there was some drop that there were some, you know, we know of 15 farmers markets, you know, that closed as well as some farmers markets that can't cancel some markets, but, you know, I think you would definitely still see a big drop per market occurrence, given the overall, you know, 50% drop in sales. So this is Kelly, um, to follow up on what Ari said, yes, we know some of that um, is, some of it is attributable to fewer people attending on the days that markets were open, and some of it was attributable to um, fewer market days, which we know that many, many, not all, but many markets, most of the markets in the state had fewer days that they were open this year than last year. So it's both. Um, the other thing um, that Ari mentioned earlier, we don't compare like one market from one year to the other, but each year we have come up with a methodology for accounting for all of the markets in the state, whether they take the census or not. So each year we're not just tallying up everybody who responded to the survey and then one year versus everybody responded to the survey 
the next year, we're looking at our total estimated statewide sales for each year. Um, that may be a little granular for some folks, but I think that might be answering some questions. Um, also to Jeff's question, what processes do the markets use to measure sales at their market? That varies widely, but we do also have a methodology for kind of cleaning that data. We ask them how they collect their data, and then we assign them a value for their like, for how reasonable um, and uh, we think their, uh, their numbers are. So if they tell us they're using, you know, some sort of periodic sales check-ins to with their vendors to approximate it, we might use their numbers. If they're like, I have no idea, this is just a guess. We don't use their numbers in the process that we use to estimate statewide sales data. So um, we'd be happy to connect. Anybody who's interested in that, it's getting a little, a little granular, but anybody who's further interested in that, we'd be happy to connect you with Ari to talk more about that. And also, if anyone on the call today has a really great way for collecting sales data at your market, you can drop that in the chat box. And I'm sure folks would be interested in knowing how you approach it. Um, so that is it for the chat box questions. So let's move to the first discussion question. Um, feel free to answer in the chat and we can get a general sense of what's going on. So um, how does the data that was presented here line up with your experience at your market? somewhere in Oregon. Uh, was it the same? Did you see different trends in your attendance and sales? Um, or did you, uh, did you hold steady from 2019 to 2020? Give folks a couple minutes to type into the chat box. And uh, Rebecca, I do see your um, your other question and I'm gonna save that one for our overflow question time to make sure that gets answered. Looks like um, the association in the Corvallis Albany area um, was restricted in vendor numbers because of space. That's I think a common one that we've seen. Um, David from the Farmer's Market Fund says that this trend um, looks to line up with what they're seeing with many markets they work with throughout the state. Um, Amanda from Umpqua Valley Farmer's Market um, says that her sales increased actually but they did follow the downward trends on vendor numbers and occurrences. Um, Katie Furia from the FDNP um, program says that the WIC and FDNP sales and redemption were lower in 2020, um, both that would follow that trend. Thanks for sharing guys. And we have two more kind of prompts that um, for you guys to think about, um, you know, does the statewide data give you any sort of new perspective on your own market? You know, were you wondering about something and this helps you understand it? Um, or um, is there anything that you would really like to know about Oregon markets that you want us to ask in next year's census that you don't think that we asked this year? Um, if so, feel free to drop that in the chat. Um, I think we're gonna, in the interest of time, we're gonna move on to the next section, but Alice is gonna keep track of anything that you guys ask or mention to make sure that it doesn't get lost. And if we have time, we can circle back to it at the, um, at the end of our presentation for our final discussion. Um, okay, let's turn this over to Amanda to start digging in on the, these kind of topics that we asked about these topical questions. Hi everybody. Um, so we just looked at the big picture of what happened with markets in Oregon this past year. Now we're going to dig in on a few topics where we need to spend more time. Um, and like before, you can, uh, and uh, at the end of this section, we'll have some Q&A and group discussion time. So in the census this year, we asked a couple of questions to help us gauge how markets describe the equity work that they're doing or not doing and the degree to which it's considered operations work. 
and also what OFMA can do to help support markets in doing more DEI work. The first question we asked gave a list of examples of activities we thought markets might be engaging in to be anti-racist. And uh, to recap that engagement that at the basic level, the individual taking the census had at least attended a training by OFMA or elsewhere. Um, of the 78 markets who responded to the census, 49 were able to say yes. Um, fewer had taken actions at the organizational level of their market. 35 respondents said that their market announced their support of the BLM movement, um, actively recruited BIPOC vendors, had equity spelled out in their operations, or had dedicated time and budget to DEI. Um, I'm showing these numbers to illustrate the need for OFMA to take action ourselves on organizational racism and also to lead member markets in doing the same. And that we need to make a range of tools for that that can work with the markets who haven't yet put time and money aside for this. Um, and I also want markets to see here the uh, work that their peers are taking. Um, I'm hoping it'll influence more to do the same and show that there are role models to look to in our, in our community. Um, most all markets said that they wanted to do more and would like OFMA to provide training and help with making their vendor handbooks and policies equitable. Um, OFMA's DEI committee is setting up a series of opportunities for this, beginning with a workshop on uprooting white supremacy, which will establish a shared understanding among farmers markets in Oregon about systemic oppression and how white supremacy can manifest in our organizations. This is going to be a facilitated workshop by the team at Aorta, and they will have us all work on putting racial justice into the center of our organizations. Um, and that'll be followed up by three sessions for markets to use the skills they learned in the initial training and address the culture practices and policies that exclude BIPOC from participating in our farmers markets. Um, so look for more info on this soon and we hope that you all sign up. Okay, looking at the pandemic and the wildfires this year, we saw three major impacts. A lot of markets were open less, had fewer vendors and less revenue. Um, although markets strove to stay open and serve their communities and nearly half the census respondents were able to maintain their regular market schedule, that still left a staggering 40% who either decreased the number of days open or they just, didn't, they just simply didn't open at all in 2020. Markets also shrunk in size. Only a quarter of you who responded to the survey and who were also open in 2019 were able to say that your total number of vendors hosted increased between 2019 and 2020. Otherwise, 75% reported that their total numbers decreased or again, they just weren't open in 2020. With these two factors, it's not surprising to hear then that three fourths of responding markets who were open in 2019 um, reported decreased revenues or stall fees, sponsorships and earned income. Only 24% indicated that their revenue had grown or mostly just stayed the same. Uh, the stress of this year also showed up in personnel turnover, um, which became one of the other defining impacts of the pandemic and the wildfires. Markets lost institutional knowledge and capacity during 2020's heightened period of disruptions. And knowing that even before this year, running a farmer's market is a complex um, and is complex and often done on unsustainable staffing levels, um, OFMA stepped up to provide important assistance this year. Um, keeping up on the constantly changing COVID regulations and what specifically you needed to do to follow them, along with advocating to the authorities that they make rules in the first place that are both safe and sensible for how farmers markets actually work um, was the most important pandemic related assistance you said you appreciated from OFMA. And you also valued us bringing markets together to discuss the ins and outs of operating a market this year and that having a time and place to hear from your peers uh, help generate and spread working strategies and innovations, along with a sense of support and camaraderie. Uh, so now looking at online farmers markets, um, which was a big change this year. Um, and just to note, this is just a quick recap. Afma reported in depth last month on our online markets project, and you can find a recording of that presentation at our website under conference proceedings. So prior to this year, only four online markets existed in Oregon that we know of um, to address customer and vendor needs to find sales channels that allowed for greater social distancing and safety. That number jumped to 30 this year. And so 
to 30 markets trying online pre-order platforms. Um, the vendors at these markets ended up making half a million in sales. However, it's important to note that three fourths of those sales were concentrated into only four markets. Most didn't gross quite so much. For software, most markets used What's Good, followed by local food marketplace, and a few used other systems to run their online sales. On average, with all the platforms used, markets reported their overall experience was moderately positive at about 3.5 on a five point scale. The more important factor in satisfaction though was the correlation to a market size and capacity. Larger markets reported moderate satisfaction, so about a middle range on a five point scale, while the smaller ones were more likely to have polarized experiences and reported being either extremely dissatisfied or extremely satisfied with how they felt about their, the software choice that they made. This held true across all software types and mark, so basically markets abilities to be flexible and devote time and effort to their systems is what pointed to their success less than the particular software that they chose. A few more specific lessons about online markets that we learned this year were that being able to manage good communication, um, was super important. Um, specifically, a lot of this communication came down to the challenges with messaging the benefits of online sales to their vendors and getting them to keep their um, product lists updated. Uh, another lesson and kind of like the baseline of how markets already exist is that fruit and veggies are key to getting customers to use online ordering, but having a diversity of value added products will make it more successful. Customers need produce, but they also want the other stuff available to make it worth their time. Um, and as far as different models used on site for pickup and looking at the labor involved for markets on that, which is important since it's capacity that drove success, um, drive-through markets and or aggregation of orders um, required the most work for markets. And obviously the easiest then involved customers just going right to the vendor to pick up their orders. And then finally, when considering adding online sales, markets need to think about their stall fees and if they can withstand a loss of revenue. Um, if vendors aren't gonna have a booth at the market or they need to look at changing or charging their vendors a fee for online presence. Okay, so that gets us to discussion time on, on these topics. Um, we know that markets experienced challenges really differently though last year, and we're wondering how did 2020 impact your market? While we're waiting for folks to put that um, in, in answer to that question in, into the chat box, we do have one question from Rachel Ward about the staff turnover rates. Um, so how were those rates of turnover calculated in the three categories? Does that re represent the percentage of markets that had turnover in those positions or the average rate of turnover or something different, just a little more info on that stat. Yeah, so that was the per, so we asked markets, did we listed out the different, different types of position, different staff position and board and volunteer and asked, did you have turnover in these um, during the year in any of these positions? And so those percentages represent of the markets that responded, um, that percentage is how many had turnover. Yeah, so this is Kelly. And to be to for clarity, that is the percent of responding markets. So when we talked about that economic data, we did a lot to try to account for the state as a whole. With these questions, we're just talking about responding markets. Those that responded to the survey. Yeah, so are there topics from last season that are not represented here that were significant for your market? Um, we dug in on DEI, COVID and wildfire impacts, personnel turnover, online markets. Like, did, did something else happen in 2020 that was like different than this or related but not talked about that you're, you're interested in learning more about or was significant to your market? Or do you have any other questions for Amanda?
Alice, do we have any questions or uh, comments you want to highlight here? Yeah, we do. Um, we do have a couple comments about um, something that was a challenge to many people was getting folks to um, and enforcing those COVID guidelines at your market, having people not eat and make sure everyone is wearing their mask. I think that's a, a universal that some folks are expressing um, on the customer side. And um, Rebecca Landis from the Corvallis Albany market group um, wants to emphasize the cultural losses from that staff turnover could, um, should be mentioned in that final report. And um, Lane County Farmers Market's biggest impact was a decreased vendor count and that led to decreased market income um, due to space. And um, Lisa from the Monavia Farmers Market is interested in hearing from other folks on the call about how they kept some sort of market programming uh, during this time or how you're going to keep that going when you lose momentum to something like a pandemic. Um, I don't see any topics coming in. Oh, Rebecca asks, how many markets, um, do we know how many markets changed their physical location due to these factors this year? Oh, that's such a good question, yeah. Rebecca. We did not ask that question, did we, Amanda? No, but I wish we had. <laughs> yeah, we asked how many markets, um, we did ask a question about um, having a reduced number of um, market days. And what we found is the majority of the markets in the state had decreased revenue. A majority of markets had um, decreased numbers of market days, even those that, those that retained their vendors. A lot of them like started a little late or had to cancel because of wildfire smoke. So the number of market occurrences, we did not ask a question about locations. We wish we had. We also wish that we had asked a question in 2019 census about personnel turnover, because we know that personnel, like board, staff, um, turnover at farmers markets is kind of high because it's a kind of like low, um, the pay rates um, are kind of over staff. So we had some comparison data from 2019, but we do think that that turnover rate that we're seeing it, anecdotally, we just think it's much higher this year than normal, um, even though we don't have the comparison data. In terms of that location question, we got a couple people in the chat box. Um, Molly Natariani from the Farmer's Market Fund notes that all of the double up food bucks markets that were at hospitals, perhaps they were part of a veggie RX program or something like that, all of those folks had to relocate or cancel their market due to the pandemic. Um, Amanda from the Umqua Valley Farmer's Market said that they shifted their um, operation completely outside and they're still there. So good for you for sticking it out through the winter in your outdoor location. Um, Alexis from Lane County says that they were able to secure more square footage to, um, to get more space to help maintain some level of vendors during um, the distanced times. Um, and they also moved their holiday market outside, which is usually a, um, an inside occurrence. Same with the Albany Farmers Market. They move their holiday market to the outside. So maybe that's something that we can get some anecdotal data on going forward. Yeah, I mean, we know that you guys had to change your operations really radically um, from like changing locations, canceling market days, blowing up your footprints, moving inside markets outside. I mean, you guys did so much. Um, it's just been really incredible to see. Um, Alice, did I see a comment from somebody in Arizona? Yes, um, we have Kelly from Arizona joining us today. Hi, um, and they said that they saw a lot of markets having to change their physical ad or location in Arizona due to site hosts that had restrictions on events because of on their campuses um, or in their parking lots or wh what have you. Um, and Kelly, do you want to speak to how that might have been different or translated to the Oregon context? Because I know we were able to get the state to designate farmers markets as an essential business, but many folks do still consider farmers markets to be 
an event. And so we had to walk that line. And that also speaks to the question about programming that we had at the top. Um, like how did people navigate being an event versus an essential business distributing food? And I think that's could be linked to a state definition as it was here in Oregon. But, um, and Kelly also, Kelly Villa also says um, that they were, had to move all of their um, markets that were on those locations that um, either were ho co now co-hosting vaccine sites um, and before were kind of those community gathering places that were being um, told not to host events like churches, community colleges, and the like. There's some other folks in the chat um, saying that it is uh, something that other cities and municipalities were concerned with from a permitting standpoint. Um, and a lot of people face some form of hardship getting those permits because some cities were considering farmers markets events, although the state here in Oregon did deem them essential businesses. Kelly, can you share, did your, is this is a state policy level. Um, did you get any state policy guidance on farmers markets as essential businesses versus events, or is this happening on a community to community basis? Our markets here in Arizona were deemed essential and part of essential businesses as well. And still with those private entities or very overly, I would say overly cautious folks that didn't understand markets as essential, despite the repeated communications about that, still it was a struggle and very concerned um, cities and counties were still overriding, that, attempting to override that. Um, and also the private businesses, such as those churches that had gigantic, wonderful parking lots available on Saturdays, for example, um, just weren't, weren't ready to continue hosting events, what they considered events in this way. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, we dealt with the same thing. Our markets, I'm sure, can share that we had strong support from the state, um, from the state level um, of markets ability to be open, but a lot of markets that needed municipal permits. Um, we had a couple of markets that were on the coast. Um, that were, or most of the year, because their municipal governments were very um, concerned about health impacts for their community. And so we're coming up to the end of time for this comment period, um, but I do want to draw attention to one more question in the chat that maybe folks can type their answer into. Alexis asked about how different, um, Alexis from the Lane County Farmers Market asked about how other markets were able to accommodate their prepared food vendors. Um, were they still able to set up? How are you enforcing the to-go only um, policies and how other markets approach that? If you have experience with that, we would love to um, see your advice in the chat box and I will mark that down to circle back later. Thanks, Alice and everybody. All right, let's move on. Um, and we're gonna hear from Amanda. We're gonna move into this kind of vendor level because um, we know what the market's experience as a whole is different than what the vendors themselves experienced at the vendor level. So Amanda and um, Dr. Ray are gonna take us through some of the data we have for that. Right, um, so uh, we haven't really seen the vendor level story yet, and OFMA doesn't have all of the state's vendors data, but we do have a really good data set for five farmers markets, and we want to present that case study to you now. Um, the five markets um, we have vendor data for are part of OFMA's beginning vendor support network. This network was this project was started in late 2018 when OFMA put together a cohort of market managers and staff from five markets through an intense three-year training program to help them boost the success of their beginning vendors. The markets involved are small to medium-sized and mostly rural, and the project centers around a community of practice model where the market staff regularly share know-how with each other and receive technical assistance from experts. And this project was mainly funded with a farmer's market promotion program grant. Um, all throughout this project, the markets collected tons of data. A result of this is that we have two years of sales data from 350 vendors um, for every market day that they attended, along with regular crowd counts and surveys of vendors' business goals. 
And we're reporting this data back to you now to show you experiences of a section of vendors in Oregon for 2020. And I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Ray, and who's the lead researcher um, often is working with to analyze the data on this project. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so earlier today, you heard about the high level summary um, from Ari, and we just wanted to show you how this group of markets does compare. So when we look at total vendors, we saw the same, the same average as the OFMA, a loss of 30%. When we look at crowd counts, that's also similar, 46% decline compared to 48% across OFMA. And when it comes to gross sales, this is where you see divergence. On average, our market saw a 9% decline in total sales compared to that decline, that far bigger decline at the state, um, the, the full network. So I also want to point out a definition. This project was really trying to understand how farmers markets serve as small business incubators. So we divide our vendors um, into two groups, new and beginning vendors or NBVs. These have four years of farmer's market experience anywhere in the US or less, and then established vendors. So here we look at um, the declines in, in total vendor numbers and total sales. Um, you can see our new and beginning vendors saw a much larger sales decrease than the overall average. Next. The big takeaway from these two years of data suggests that core vendors and customers were more likely to persist in the 2020 market season. So although um, what we found in our data is that average customer spending increased 49% while total customers declined 46%. And we saw higher average daily sales for all vendor types. We'll get more into that in a minute. Um, next. So just as the market outcomes were mixed, so were the vendor outcomes. We did a postseason survey of our vendors, and then we also compared that to their act to actual sales data. The postseason survey was anonymous, so we're just looking at the averages of all survey respondents and um, the sales data. Responding vendors as a whole had a fairly accurate perception of how 2020 went compared to 2019, and you can see they kind of fall into almost three equal categories of those who saw sales increase, sales decrease, or sales that were within $1,000 of 2019, that's sales unchanged. Um, and I, I want to kind of, again, make the plug that we hope this information is interesting, and we hope that it maybe encourages more markets to start doing data collection. Uh, it's been a, a process to learn with our markets, but we think that we can really say a lot more about what's happening in the market when we do collect this data. And I'll add that some of the data you're going to see in the next slides did come from a supplemental survey so we could learn more about the wide range of uh, vendors that come to markets and what their goals are. Next. So here we're looking at vendors in three different categories farm vendors, and this is any vendor that is producing on-site. So even if it's a cheese producer, but they also own the that animal that's producing the milk, they are a farm vendor. All other value-added vendors, prepared foods at the market, um, and then crafts and art vendors. Looking across all of our vendors, comparing 2019 to 2020, Average daily sales increased for all of these groups. No, these are average daily sales, Molly. So this is just dollars. Um, and we, you can see the largest increase for farm vendors. But let's dig into that a little bit. Next. So what we find a very clear trend, and this, this is true for all three categories, I just took off the crafts and art vendors for simplicity. The vendors with the highest sales in 2019 were more likely to return in 2020. So take a look at those farm vendors and the, um, those green bars that are in that box. 
those farm vendors saw a large increase. I just showed you that. That's how this compounds over time. Uh, it's the same group of farmers. They're light green were their sales in 2019. Dark green were their sales in 2020, the ones who came back. Now you look at the two smaller bars. The light blue were those brand new farm vendors who showed up for the first time. This is their average season sales. And the orange vendors are those farm vendors from 2019 who chose not to come back in 2020. I find the difference in those season sales totals very striking. And if, if 2021 would be like 2020, we would expect very few of those brand new 2020 vendors from last year that had extremely low sales to persist at the market in 2021. Because a year ago, those vendors, those, those vendors with the lowest sales were making a choice not to show up at market in 2020. Um, the value added trend is not quite as stark, but the value added vendors who returned were making nearly twice as much as the value added vendors that chose not to come back to market and the vendors that showed up at the market in 2020 but were not there in 2019. So to me, this is kind of, this is a question of who's gonna be at the market in 2021. Um, and, and should there be more intentional efforts to, to try to pull in um, vendors that, that may be on the fence, um, partially because they had sort of a, a hard sales year last year. Uh, next, Amanda. We also can look at this by years of total farmers market experience. And as a business gets older, their years of farmers market experience increases, they were more likely to return to the market this year. So there are two things happening in this chart. Uh, if you look at the dark green bars with the percentages, that shows you the uh, retention rate by years of farmers market experience in 2019. So under that first year, that's our lowest retention rate, 39%. But the height of that green bar, you know, we had over 50 vendors who were in their first year of farmers market experience in 2019. That's a lot. This is, this is helping us look more into this idea of farmers markets as a business incubator. A lot of businesses come to the market, uh, then they, they don't always come back. And after vendors who were in their third year of farmers market experience and older had much higher retention rates, 55% or higher. Um, so what we hope to do in this last year of this project is to look back at those non-returners and try to learn why they left and where they are now. You know, are they migrating to other channels? Which ones and why? And for those who have persisted, it's a, it's a different set of questions. It's, it's how has the farmer's market helped you pivot your business, adapt your business and be successful? Next. Another thing we see is that when I say the core vendors and core customers were more likely to persist, that's what the, our data suggests. Here are the year over year sales for returning vendors only by their years of farmer's market experience. So we saw only 39% of first year farmer's market vendors came back in 2020, but this group had very strong sales in compared to last season. That's in the green circle right there. The dark bar were their 2020 sales compared to the light, the light bar of their 2019 sales. And the other groups that saw an increase were established vendors, those with five years of farmer's market experience or more. The increase is smaller, but it's still there. I'll note on this chart that the fourth year vendors are a bit of an outlier. This was a small group of vendors, so there's some small numbers issues here, but they were extremely successful in 2019. The ones who came back attended fewer days and their average daily sales were actually a little bit lower 
not higher as the overall trends showed us. And those two factors compounded for a bigger uh, season decline. Next. So this is just kind of food for thought, looking at uh, average daily sales by how often a vendor attended the market, broken up into um, quartiles. So there's kind of a, a bump here in these very these vendors who don't show up very often. They do better than than um, vendors in the next category. But looking at those next three participation categories, as a vendor increases their participation, average daily sales increases. The light pink was 2019 data. The darker pink is 2020 data. So we see the same trend over two years. And we don't know the, the direction, um, what's, what's happening here, what's causing what. Uh, there's probably both, right? Good sales make a vendor more likely to return, with some exception about the ones who don't attend very often. And coming to a market more often, you build customer base, you build familiarity, you're able to do more testing of product um, and, and attain higher sales. So that's kind of some interesting food for thought. Next. So I wanted to talk again, another way to look at um, attendance rates and sort of how different vendors are using a market and using a market during a pandemic, especially, um, we see setting aside retention, but just looking at attendance, farm vendors, but only established farm vendors, those with five years of farmer's market experience or more, as a group, were the only group to increase their attendance rate at markets this year. Um, when you look, that's in the dark uh, teal bar and the black arrow. The yellow bars show attendance rates for new and beginning farm or vendors, new and beginning farm vendors. So not only do new and beginning vendors attend less often than established farm vendors, that was true in 2019, it was true in 2020, but the gap increased substantially in 2020. So established vendors were making more use of markets, they're attending more often, they saw higher sales increase. New and beginning vendors um, are not, and, and why? You know, what, what are some of the barriers or, or what, what are the, the factors behind the choice to come to market or not? Uh, next. So this kind of brings us to our, our discussion. Um, We'd love to kind of hear your questions. I haven't been following the chat. And, and again, the first question is, how does this line up with your own um, vendor experience? So we have a couple questions in the chat box um, while people are typing in their reactions to the discussion question on the screen. Um, I have a question from Rebecca Landis about that bump um, that we saw for the first season vendors and if there was any accounting for like differences in product type within the farm category like for folks um, I think all the, the managers on the call know that there is a huge demand for fruit at our farmers markets here in Oregon so short season fruit could have played a part in that or do you have any um, inclination like based on farm product type what that could look like um so I think Rebecca's talking about like the first year returning vendors. Um, Rebecca, I didn't, I didn't do a deep analysis on how many vendors changed categories. There were a few, but most vendors are in the same category as they were last year. So when we narrow it down to just returning vendors, we are mostly controlling for vendor mix, but not completely. Uh, this is Kelly. I think the 
the three most interesting things about the slide, I've had a while to sit with this data because Mallory sent me this presentation before. And the three most interesting things that I like gleaned from this um, that I'm really interested in your, um, everybody's kind of thoughts on were that like, even during a pandemic, at least with this group of markets, these like core established vendors were retained. You guys maintained the heart of your farmer's market, even through a pandemic, which is amazing. And I'm, I'm interested in the, do the other farmers markets feel like, yes, we were able to maintain our core as well. You know, we, we suffered some losses. We had a lot of expenses, but like the heart of our market's still there. Other thing that I learned from this, like that first year is like, like the hump, right? So like, we were curious, like, do most vendors at least give it two seasons or like, do they just try one? If they're not successful, they leave. So like what we're, I'm learning at least in these markets is that that year one is like the year. You support them, they succeed or they leave, which may be good in some cases, they're not suited for the market, but maybe in other cases, there are maybe some marginal folks we're losing that we could retain to build our vendor pool. And the third thing is I know you guys have told your, your vendors over and over again, you have to show up every time, they have to, your customers have to expect to be able to find you, you have to build your brand, you have to come consistently, you will do better. The fact that they did better both overall and on each individual day when they came consistently to market, like, you guys can now say like the data proves you will succeed in this, right? Like this is the, the data shows what I'm telling you is not just my advice. It is, this is real. So those are the things I'm, I found most interesting from this. Um, based on that, the consistency question, Ari from the Hollywood farmers market who we heard from earlier has a question about how those low attendance rates um, were divided. So there could be two different scenarios, vendors who come sporadically throughout the season, they don't show up every week, or it could be vendors who simply leave the market mid-season. Perhaps they, um, for example, when I um, used to run a farmer's market, we had somebody who only had orchard fruit. And so she only came in the second half of the season because that's when her orchard fruit was ready. Or there's folks who focus really heavily on berries um, who might have a shorter season and not attend the full farmer's market season. Was that accounted for in those numbers? Oh, now I understand. Okay, so no, and actually um, that's probably I should look into that because I think Rebecca, what Rebecca is saying, and and yeah, the market attendance is there. Yeah, <laughs> it's very different vendor to vendor. Um, some will disappear in the middle and just come earlier, not. But I bet you're right, Rebecca. Some of those low attendance rates are very short season, high high demand products. They come, they sell, they're gone. But this is Kelly, if anything, that would kind of like be ameliorating this like this low earning we see for low um, attendance folks because the, those types of vendors tend to like have high sales and like short bursts. But what we saw is on average, these folks, Mallory, correct me if I'm wrong, but they made higher average, they made lower, low attendance vendors made lower average daily sales, not just overall sales. So we didn't account for that, but if anything, those would be artificially even making their daily sales look higher. So even with having those short season folks in that group, um, it, the, those, that group looks like it has lower daily sales. Is that? Yeah, accurate? Amanda, can you go back to that slide real quick? I, I think Kelly, what we're doing is explaining the the, oh, there we go. See this less than 25% attendance and the higher sales. We think this is actually those short season, high value stuff, lavender, um, you know, just those fresh Oregon strawberries. Um, I'll have to think about that, Rebecca, um, and figure out a way to consistently measure that. Like I'm thinking about like, you know, less than 25%, but it was like consistent. It Like all of the attendance happened in consecutive weeks. If we can sort that out from less than 25%, but the attendance was sporadic and not consecutive weeks. I think I can do, do that and that would be interesting. Because that would cover not only those short <clears throat> vendors that naturally have short seasons, but also vendors that 
leave in the middle of the season, potentially due to low sales, even um, mm -hmm. vendors that rather than attending sporadically and not being consistent, just leave the market and therefore have a lower attendance rate. Mm -hmm. Good feedback, you guys. Uh, we have a question from Alexis at the Lane County Farmers Market. Um, does market placement play a big factor into this data? Um, is that measured at all? Like where new um, vendors are positioned within the market? Um, do most market managers focus on placing new, vem new vendors in a more visible or trafficked area? Or... Um, do folks, I guess this is two questions. Was market placement accounted for in this data? And for folks attending the call, um, do you place your new vendors in the high traffic areas or do you place your core vendors in the high traffic area? And how do you make those decisions? Yeah, real quickly, this data does not, we don't have um, vendor placement information tied to this. It's That's a question for you guys. Feel free to let us, we're curious about how you guys do that in support of your new and beginning vendors and how you balance that with seniority. It's a topic that has come up on our BVSN calls quite often. So it looks like uh, some folks are chiming in in the chat um, that Rebecca from the Corvallis Albany Market Group um, says that they try to support their new vendors with a good display and good suggestions there to overcome um, being in a different portion of the market because they do allocate space based on seniority at that market. And other things that folks brought up in the chat um, was a question, um, well, a comment really from Amanda Pastoria about new and beginning vendors and why um, they might do better year over year if they stick it out. Um, there's a certain level of trial and error um, or they don't have the quantity or variety to compete with some of the other ones, but there's a learning curve. So if they can um, get over that learning curve and learn from those varieties and volume questions the first year, then they might be more successful going forward. And um, another thing that folks are doing that's coming up in the chat um, as helpful for new vendors, um, if they can't be placed in a high traffic area, is to feature them in your market promotions on social media, introduce them to your followers, um, and if and making sure that you tell people where to look for them. Um, and Terry Ann recommends that they try to put their new vendors with an older vendor to try to do um, a little bit of encouragement and maybe have them make friends with one of the more established vendors at the market, get a little bit of in, informal mentorship um, and refer them to the Small Business Development Center for guidance if they have questions about how to grow their business. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's let's move on to the next discussion question. Keep feel free to keep sharing in the chat, folks. Um, so one of the things that Mallory mentioned is that um, um, what thinking about 2021, what can markets try to do to recruit back the vendors that they'd like to see back um, to market in the upcoming season, um, or to help incubate those new and beginning vendors that come to them in 2021. Um, the other question is, um, I think we had a customer question too. Is that true? Okay. I'll just say for a minute too, you know, even, even during this year with all of its challenges, uh, roughly a third of the vendors who were at market in 2020 were not with us in 2019. So there's always this I mean, well, two years of data suggests there's always a big rush of people who show up to, to try it out. I'm curious, um, we'll see what the data shows for this year. Uh, 
uh, Kelly from Arizona shares that they've heard of some vendors that refuse to wear masks during the pandemic that will not be invited back until the pandemic is over. Um, and even then, maybe not. Um, so that could also, COVID compliance could be a factor in um, not only voluntary participation in the market, but also being disinvited from your market. Um, I know some folks had difficulty getting vendors um, to comply with the COVID guidelines. And of course, space will affect what everyone does. Um, Rebecca from Corvallis says that they don't have any space um, because of the distance required at their Corvallis site. Um, so they don't have any space for new vendors. And so they're inviting them to their smaller market in Albany that has more space, more physical space for new vendors. Oh, and Lisa did bring up the good point that um, the ban on sampling that happened for most of the season and then the barriers to sampling with the COVID guidelines um, was, a, was a detriment to new vendors who were trying to um, introduce new products or introduce the quality of their product to, to a new audience at the farmer's market. Uh, we did have someone, um, Ashley, saying that the way that they handle the spots and um, where you place your beginning vendors um, is based on their product type so that customers can more easily find what they're looking for at the market. Um, like if they have a baker vendor who has left and you bring in a new bakery vendor, they put their, that vendor in the same spot as the old bakery vendor so folks can find what they're looking for, even if it's not from the same exact human going forward. Um, there's also some discussion in the chat about um, lower vendor fees for new vendors, and that could be a way to help introduce people and uh, lower the barrier to entry to hopefully have some folks succeed. Um, are there any other questions? that we haven't covered yet. I don't, mm, yeah, the sampling thing is coming up again in the chat box. There were some people who withdrew applications from markets around the state because they weren't able to sample. That can be, um, especially in my experience for prepared food vendors, that can be a huge barrier if you are new and folks are not familiar with your product. Are there any other questions for Mallory about this data before we move on? Also, Alice, the, um, one other thing that we wanted to ask about, we've got about you know 10 more minutes for this call. Um, so we can open it up for any questions or anything you guys wanna talk about. And also this last prompt is another thing we've seen is that we retain those really core committed customers, your average customer spending per cu total customer visitation was down, but your spending per customer was up. Um, I'm wondering if you guys felt you saw the same thing. And then also when this pandemic is over and it's safe to do so, how do we go about recruiting those ca like more casual customers back, either returners or you know future customers um, when it's safe to do so? Oh, Vonda. <laughs> yes, you guys, let's everybody just like raise your virtual wave at the screen if you are so excited to have like music and kids programs and face painting and everything again. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it looks like in the chat, the overwhelming, um, the mindset is to really promote those extras that we weren't allowed to do during the pandemic. Uh, kids activities, 
music, activities in general, cooking demonstrations, all of those kinds of things that the pandemic um, really put off the table. Um, promoting that stuff seems to be a big strategy for recruiting those new folks back. I want to acknowledge that um, this is a comment that Rebecca Landis made at the very beginning of the pandemic um, when we were doing like 10 million radio interviews a, a week and is that like we have spent years building this really lovely and complicated social fabric at our markets, making it feel like an event. At its core, it's grocery, right? It's food and farm products. But we made it feel like an event just to get people there and build community and all these things. And then what Rebecca said is we just, we wove all this fabric over the years and then we had to just unravel it overnight and really strip it down in order to like, that the state regulators would let us stay open. You know, we had to strip it down to its heart, which is the farmers. Um, and we are reweaving that fabric is gonna be complicated. We acknowledge that. We're just so proud of you guys for, for making it happen. Um, at least the, the unweaving overnight part. Uh, Rachel Ward also shared that um, there's some hope that once the casual customers who may have joined us in 2020 for the first time uh, for local food and the benefits of a shorter supply chain and um, less risk of COVID exposure um, with the food, the better taste and the safety aspects of local food will keep them coming in. So just keep um, hammering those points home with your markets to make sure that folks know that even if the pandemic has calmed down and people are getting vaccinated, the, the safety benefits and taste benefits and nutrition benefits of local food have not changed. You can still get all of those benefits by shopping at your farmer's market and reminding your customers that that could be um, valuable going forward. Kathy, um, I see from Minnesota, you said you're especially trying to keep the ones um, that came to the online markets. Do you want to talk about, have you guys discussed that? Do you have a strategy for retain? We have a lot of markets that also adopted online markets. Have you guys discussed any strategy for retaining those online shoppers that might be new to market? Kelly, my internet is not working right now. Um, and you can hear my baby lamb screaming in the background. So apologies for that. Um, no, we just know that we, you you folks, I, I have to go listen to your recording. You had 30 markets switched to online platforms. We did not have that many. But the ones that did, we saw a tremendous uptick in brand new customers that we know because we did a lot of customer uh, surveys. So now how to hang on to them um, and yet make it profitable or doable at the market level because those online platforms we aggregate took a lot more money, right, to do that, a lot more time. So, nope, we're still learning. Thanks for sharing. And thanks for sharing the baby lambs too. I think we all needed that. <laughs> Alice, any other comments or questions? Um, we... I guess my question to the group is um, if you all represent a farmer's market that did go online in at least a portion of your sales during COVID, is that something that you see yourself continuing? Do you want to keep this online portion going or is this something that was crisis response and you would rather not go forward with it? I think a lot of customers may have come to us through these online markets when grocery store shelves were empty, but it's not something that everybody um, sees as the core or a, uh, a huge asset to their market. Maybe it's been, made your market really difficult from a logistics standpoint or administration standpoint. Um, do you all think that this, that online markets are here to stay and will you continue using them?
Rebecca from the Corvallis Albany Market Group shares that they are moving forward for now and would like to continue, but um, they need to get to a place where they can, uh, a level of orders where they can justify the administration and expense, which I think is a really good point. It has to be a certain level of successful uh, to continue it after. Um, Ari from the Hollywood Market says that they will not be um, using what's good anymore because the sales numbers weren't there for them through that platform. Um, people really liked it during the beginning of the pandemic um, up through May of 2020 when, when the peak and then it steeply fell off after that. So maybe it's a question of wait and see if it is um, feasible for markets going forward based on those sales numbers coming through that online platform. Um, and to let you guys know, we did ask a question about this on the census. We do have some more detailed information. We just couldn't pack it all into this presentation. So when that report comes out, there's some information in case you're wondering what your peers are doing um, on general levels, the software satisfaction, who intends to continue and persist with online markets, et cetera. So we'll have some additional information for you. Um, Amanda, is there anything else that we need to do to wrap up? Uh, just say thank you to everyone. Um, yeah, thank you all again for taking the census and sharing your markets information. Um, we really hope that seeing it turn back around gives you some answers and perspective on the thing to this challenging season. Um, and I just want to thank Kelly, Ari, and Mallory for digging into all this data with me over the past couple months because it's been such a pleasure to work with you guys and your terrific expertise firsthand. And um, also thank you to Alice for your stellar command on the Q&A and to Rachel and Melissa for so smoothly running the, their tech needs today. And if people have more questions, here's our contact info on the screen to get in touch to, for more follow-up. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Bye everyone. Thank you all.